You like that? I know. So we build them in Texas. Use what you got, right? That's right. Let's have prayer. Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, we approach you once again. And we take advantage of this most holy opportunity to speak openly to you and to take you up to, to embrace those adoption papers you sent out to us in the name of Jesus and tell you that we indeed, we indeed, Father, uh, take you up on your offer to be not just our God but our Heavenly Father. We find our identity in you. We, we long to know your voice and obey you. We pray, Father, that you would be the one we try to uh, please and we pray, Father, that it's through you that we listen and learn who we truly are. Bless us with the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables us to adore you more fully. We pray the Spirit would be upon us these next few days to remain with us through Christmas. That your Son could receive his rightful place in our lives, which is a place of adoration and of worship. We pray as well that we would listen to what he taught through the scriptures. We thank you for the gospel writers who who wrote down what he said. We pray that today would be a day where your spirit anoints the Bible and allows us to hear from you. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This is a good time of year to remind, uh, remind the church the difference between the living word versus the written word. Uh, as most of you understand that the church functioned for about 300 or so years without the Bible. The Bible was not put together, canonized, and, and, and available to the church for the first 300 or so years. We had the name of Jesus. We had the testimonies about Jesus. We had the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Word, in a sense, was always with us because we had the Holy Spirit. After a few uh, centuries, we received the Holy Bible, which has become a, a powerful resource. Uh, we praise God for this resource. We don't worship the Bible. We worship the giver of the gift. And it's through the Bible that we can hear God. In one distinction, a, a, a theologian much wiser than me pointed out is that the Bible is similar to the manger. It's upon which the word of God is laid. And so, in a sense, it's wiser to approach the scriptures through the Holy Spirit in prayer and hear Christ, to see him emit from these scriptures, as opposed to reading it coldly and roughly and, and, and in a quick hurry. And uh, when you do that, you realize that your argument to the world that doesn't believe in Christ, you're not arguing that these are the words of God, and these are inspired words. What you're arguing is that through these holy words, God's eternal word, the living word, Christ, the word made flesh, comes, comes out, comes alive. In that way, this gift, this resource for the church, is a powerful tool. It's through which we hear God most often, uh, with most consensus. If someone if mentions scripture, that holds a lot of weight as opposed to God woke me up in a dream last night, right? And so as we approach scripture around Christmas time, be thinking of the manger. Be thinking of how it's the Bible through which God lays his son for us today through the spirit to see. When you go through the quick summary, we are in chapter 10. So we'll be looking back on chapters 1 through 9 of gospel, the gospel according to John. The first blank is that Jesus is the Christ. You'll know these by now. What's the church's job? To witness. The chapter we're in right now will end with that very uh, example, that the, that the church's job is to witness. Uh, Simeon, Greek word that means tokens of authority. If you're new with us, that's the word that St. John uses uh, in Greek to describe miracles or acts of God. All the other gospel writers use a completely different word. Only John uses Simeon. The other gospel writers, and I forget the word they use, but the word they use uh, uh, means that the miracles Jesus does are, are more about uh, the effects that those miracles perform, like healing somebody or helping somebody 
Whereas in John's Gospel, the miracles he does help happen to help people, but the primary reason he does the miracles is to drop tokens of authority, to teach the world that I'm an author, in Jesus' words, he is an authorized uh, man of God to preach and to teach. <clears throat> A centralized teaching in Jesus' ministry, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, that's going to ramp up here in the next few weeks. We get later on into further chapters. <clears throat> and Jesus is trying to instill what? Obedience. John's portrait of Jesus is a portrait where Jesus <clears throat> equates the response of love to obedience. If you love me, you would obey me. Or to the Jews, if you truly love God and Moses, you would obey the law. Or if you truly love the God of Abraham, you would live as Abraham lived. It's all about live as, it, as. so obey, live within uh, what you know to do. <clears throat> So we're just going to jump into chapter 10. <clears throat> and this is where Jesus introduces one of the most famous I am statements. John is full of the I am statements. Uh, I am the gate. I am the shepherd. I am the vine. Uh, I am uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of heaven. Uh, he goes on. I am uh, the, life. the life. I mean, the light. The light and the resurrection. He goes on. I am the resurrection. That's right. Uh, countless I ams. And so here we hit one of his most famous I am's. And he's, as we do this, just know that he actually mixes two metaphors. Jesus is two things in the same account, which makes it awfully confusing. But by the way, when Jesus teaches, whether it's through parables or just didactically just teaching, <clears throat> he's teaching concepts about a completely different world, a kingdom, which is coming to this world. And, and it's so different that there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. <clears throat> For Jesus to say, I am the shepherd, clearly that's, a, that's a, an analogy. I am like a shepherd in these ways. Uh, for him to say the kingdom of God is like uh, when somebody finds a lost coin and they celebrate. The kingdom of God is like uh, when a son returns home from being a... He, he's having to teach all these very difficult concepts to an unbelieving world. And to go back to the way he teaches parables, the way he teaches in these I am statements, many of the things he says are meant to be troubling to us. Uh, when we're looking at the parables of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you're, if you're not kind of offended or upset by something Jesus says, you're probably reading the parable wrong. It's supposed to be upsetting because it's revealing things to you you don't already know. That's the purpose of Revelation. <clears throat> And so Jesus is teaching two mixed metaphors. <clears throat> two uh, mixed metaphors upsets me as a thinker, right? It's not crisp. It's not easy to understand at that point. So just hang, hang with us today as we, as we try to piece apart, see what Jesus is trying to reveal using these two metaphors. First thing he says <clears throat> is, I am the gate. <clears throat> Verse 1, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate... <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. Let me do real good throw clear. <clears throat> I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. Uh, up in verse 9, we can jump ahead. Uh, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes in only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fill. So verse 9 says that I am the gate. Verse 9, here's a blank. There is only one gate. I'm the gate. Not I'm a gate. I'm the gate. And gates are for coming and going. That's your second blank. <laughs> Verse 2 is a great uh, lesson for pastors, for elders, and teachers in the church. It says, The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. One way to interpret that, and I've got a blank for you to write down what you want. It's kind of a larger concept. 
is that you cannot lead Jesus as, you cannot lead his sheep unless you're willing to come through Jesus. Jesus is the gate. If you truly want to lead the people of God, the, the sheep of God's pasture, you have to have you will only have access to the sheep through the gate and who's the gate? Jesus. It's a real interesting concept. Now, there's different ways to interpret this in its context. Uh, there is, as we're going to argue here in a minute, there's only one true shepherd, and we'll get to that. But there were smaller shepherds that were entrusted by God to lead the people. They're leaders, rulers. In fact, later on, we're going to, Jesus mentioned something, calls them gods with a lower G. We don't, this is something I've not really studied before until, until I was preparing for this lesson. But shepherds of the uh, Israelites were people like King David, the prophets. The priests were meant to be shepherds with a little S, not a capital S. They were entrusted to, to guide the sheep, to guide the people. And Jesus is saying, on one level, I will call you to come in and lead and be a part of my people, but you can only do so if you come through me. This is very different to another group, and here's a blank underneath it. If you come through me as the gate, you're, you're able to lead. This is ver versus being a wall scaler. What does he call the wall scalers? Who comes in over the wall? Thieves, thieves. thieves and robbers. So thieves and robbers like to scale and come over the gate. Verse 10 says what they like to do. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's a blank too. They come to steal, kill, and destroy. So there's going to be two distinctions here in a minute. Number one is that Jesus is going to compare himself to a gate. And then he's going to compare himself to a shepherd. So as the gate, Jesus is saying it's through me through which you can have access to the people to love and to lead. Um, and if you're the type of person trying to get access to people, primarily the people of God through the church, and you don't come through me, I'm going to interpret that you're coming for ulterior motives. So he always, he always has a verses. Do this as opposed to this. So thieves, thieves are the opposite of the folks that come through the gate. And who's the opposite of the good shepherd? The hired hand. So there's always something that Jesus is saying, I'm not like this guy. And so as the gate, Jesus is having this first concept. This is the difficult part of these mixed metaphors. In one little chunk, he does this to us. He's saying, I'm the gate. I'm the only, there's only one gate, and it's through me through which you can have access to the people to live and to love, uh, to love them. Now, I want you to reflect for a minute. Uh, the, the nature of the church is that we are primarily a people, not a building, not a tradition. Uh, not, we're a people. We're, we are a people who have been exposed to Jesus, and it's our job, according to John, what's our primary job? To bear witness to what we've seen. We're a people. That's all we are. And as a people, God has decided to lift up leadership. And some of the some of the branches of the church, you have a hierarchy like the Pope, and others you have a looser hierarchy like the Methodist Church. In our movement, we don't really have a hierarchy. Uh, we, we're more capitalistic, I guess. Minister, congregation can fire and hire their own preacher, kind of thing, and own their own property. But regardless of the leadership process and, and the structure uh, in terms of mobilizing the masses, every branch of the body, Catholic. Baptists all in between believes that every Christian has a pastoral ministry to accomplish. Every Christian. We are the body of Christ. And so living into your ministry, uh, by pastoral, I mean there's somebody this week you'll pastor. There's somebody you're going to come into contact with. might be your child, might be your friend, your parent, a neighbor, where you are entrusted with a moment to be a handmaiden of the gospel, right? A wit to bear witness to Christ and to pastor that person. And many times the people you're pastoring are other Christians, the sheep. If you're going to do this, you have to do it through Jesus and for Jesus. He's a black and white kind of guy in the Gospel of John, isn't he? If you don't do it through Jesus, he's going to assume you're scaling the fence and you've got some other reason to do this. 
for, for you to give of yourself, to give of your life, is, is not normal to this world. And if you're doing it not for Jesus, he's going to assume there's some sort of gain in it for you. Or you want to be needed. You know that feeling, I need to be needed? But there, it may not be an evil idea. But if you're coming through Jesus, the ministry you perform to lead his people uh, will be blessed. If you don't go through Jesus, don't expect to have a powerful pastoral ministry. <clears throat> then he calls himself the good shepherd. And this is interesting. He says, uh, the watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Next to, we have, a, we have a, a point here that says, I am the good shepherd. Access is granted for him by the watchman. Who is the watchman? In studying this, God. I think the watchman is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Same thing, right? God. I mean, <laughs> the, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit <clears throat> has been the, the person of the Trinity that has been able to access and open hearts. Uh, that's the job of the Holy Spirit right now, to go out and to be poured out to affect people as they are. When that happens, access to the, to the shepherd occurs. That's one way to interpret it. And given the fact that, that John's gospel includes a lot of Holy Spirit talk, it would be a good fit from, from this perspective that the watchman is the Holy Spirit. Which is great. That's the portion of God that is consistently with us, watching us, watching over us. In fact, uh, St. Paul calls the Holy Spirit the down payment, the guarantee, the guarantee of the kingdom of God. So you get this por portion now. It's like God owes us something or something. He, he gives us a deposit. He's going to pay the rest later. And the deposit is the Holy Spirit. And Paul is in a way that he also says, though, that he never does anything on his own. He only does what the Father told him to do, right? I mean, he says, I don't... This stuff, I'm only doing the will of who sent me. So. That's right. Yeah, the, yeah, Jesus says consistently, I have not come here to make decisions or judgments or anything. I am, again, I am the decision. My God sent me for y'all. So it's a done deal. At this point, all I'm doing is revealing what the truth is that has already been established. So I'm not making any judgments here. I'm just sharing what's, what's true. But for the watchmen who's the one that opens the gate, <clears throat> there's two ways to look at it. Number one is the watchman opens the gate for Jesus. The watchman also opens the gate for the minor shepherds. So, for instance, I can walk into a church at, you know, 33 years old, a kid practically, and stand before people who are much smarter than me, much more accomplished than I am in terms of life, more years, more children, more things going on, and somehow God has granted me access to y'all's hearts to preach. It's, it's pretty amazing the way the Holy Spirit works. So the watchman also favors those who come by the gate that aren't Christ. The gate is, I mean the gate's Jesus, but Jesus is the good shepherd, even his minor shepherds that come in. I'm going to draw a distinction here in just a minute with those minor shepherds. <clears throat> so Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. Three main points. Number one is he leads with what? No? I mean the Holy Spirit lets him in. What, what's his tool? His voice. His voice. Yeah, Holy Spirit is more philosophical. His voice is actually his instrument. And so he doesn't actually use a shepherd's crook, does he? Or a rod or a staff. We have that in the, the 23rd Psalm. But maybe the rod and the staff is just an expression of his voice. What's important about Jesus' voice? The sheep know his voice. But the people know who's speaking. Mm -hmm. And they follow him. I mean, isn't it important, because we don't know sheep herding very well, but isn't it true that the shepherd could call the sheep, and the sheep went after the shepherd? They didn't go to anybody else. And that, in the Palestinian land, yeah, it's done like that. You use your voice as your primary tool. Well, his voice has authority. And what? His voice has authority. It does. <clears throat> where, where are some biblical concepts of Jesus and voice? What are the about Jesus? 